Imagine if you could easily find solutions to make your region or city smarter, greener, better connected, more social, and closer to citizens. The InterAg Europe Policy Learning Platform can help you. Access knowledge about the latest policy trends. Discover expert validated good practices from all over Europe. Find solutions in our peer review. Get tailored support from our expert team. We can connect you with the right people and organizations. Together, we will find ways to solve your region's or city's challenges. Start your policy learning journey today. Good afternoon, welcome everybody. A warm, warm welcome to our webinar on cultural initiatives as levers of social cohesion. My name is Eric Glosson. I am a thematic expert on social issues at the, the Intreg uh, Policy Learning Platform. I will be your host today together with Mart Veliste. Maybe Mart can show himself there. <laughs> Hello. Yep. Hi, everybody. Uh, so you might have known me from the previous programming period when I was an expert on the SME competitiveness track. But now I'm also joined by Eric in the Social Europe. Uh, so happy to be collaborating with all of you on these topics. And I will be co-moderating together with Eric today. Excellent. Um, before we dive into the matter, just a few words of who we are. In addition to Martin and myself, there is Lotte in the background who will be um, managing the chat and technical issues. There's Lotte. And we also have three eminent speakers with us today. If they can come on screen and wave also. So we have um, we have first Lars Ebert from the Cultural Action Europe. Then we have Caroline Couret from Creative and Tourism Network there. And we have Diego Enriquez from the Association for Development of the Superior Technical Institute in Lisbon. There, I think I got it all. Last but least, we have uh, about 80 registered participants today. A few of you come from Interreg Europe projects. I can only mention a couple now, but we have projects such as Cherry, which is dealing with culture as an ally for COVID recovery. We have a project called MOMAR on strategic thinking uh, to the use of cultural and natural resources in uh, rural areas and many others then, which I, I cannot mention all, but there are some pro Interreg Europe projects with us. And we have a number of local and regional authorities. We have international cooperation bodies. We have academic organizations and others. Just a few uh, technical aspects for smooth functioning of this, of this webinar. It will last uh, about 90 minutes. The webinar is recorded and with materials and, and the replay will be available from the Interreg Europe website uh, after the webinar. It will be possible for all of you to interact through the chat and submit your questions. Um, there will be a time for question after each presentation, but we encourage you to submit questions at any time. So really uh, just when you have one to raise a question, just put it in the chat. The questions will be read out to the speakers by Mart or by myself um, during then these question sessions. So that's what we've done the, on, in general on this, on this webinar. Before we set off, I would just like to present a few words on why we chose this topic of cultural initiatives as levers of social cohesion. We have seen in recent years that cultural um, and creative activities have attracted a lot of attention as vectors of growth, of job, of export incomes. We've also seen that there, this notion of cultural and creative in industries has gained a lot of attention. Or more generally, um, the idea that creativity is associated to innovation. So with this notion of creative classes, for example, in cities. However, Culture is also the glue that binds communities together. And uh, during the COVID crisis, we had a full-scale full -scale experiment there of uh, what it implied to have a very much reduced access to performing arts, to cinemas, to live music, to bookshops. And we the, the negative aspects of that became very obvious. 
We're also exper experiencing increasing mistrust in social tensions, rays of populism. And it seems important at this stage to reflect on how culture can and could bring us closer together. This is a question of health, of well-being. It's a question of preserving our democracies. And it becomes then it's not only an issue for strategic priorities and policy design at EU at national levels. It's also what can an issue of what can local and regional authorities do about it? What can individual associations, what can private actors, how can they act on using culture to bring us closer to preserve um, our, our social cohesion? So these were just some introductory word for me. I would like to hear a little bit more or understand a little bit more what, what you have in mind when you come into this uh, webinar. And to this end, we have a, a short slider poll we would like to run with you. Um, you, if you open the chat now, you will see a first, um, you will see a first link to a poll. So you can just click on that link in this chat, or uh, just scan with your phone on the on the uh, on the secure code that has appeared. And first, what we'd like to know from you is what key benefits of cultural initiatives of social cohesion first come to your mind when you hear, hear about benefits of culture for social cohesion. What first comes to your mind? What we really like to see is just some keywords on this. What keywords come to your mind? And you're very welcome to reply many times. So to you can two, three, four times. Don't hesitate to provide multiple keywords that come to your mind when you think of um, these benefits of cultural initiatives. And you'll see them appearing as as you're typing in the in the uh, the word cloud on the screen. We'll take a few seconds to see them appearing. Interesting to see up empath empathy as a big one already. Cooperation, of course. Participation and integration. empowerment also so empowerment through culture mutual understanding so integration mutual understanding of connected notions we have 20 yet can we get a few more <laughs> sense of belonging is also coming up yes multiple on belonging on territories <laughs> meaning of life also <laughs> good but we already have a nice word cloud coming up here already with integration as a really so integrating persons communities it's something maybe we can get back to in the discussion what exactly are we, in are we integrating notions of understanding and trust understanding each other Participation is so about multiple on bottom up and participation also. And empathy is also interesting. This notion of understanding each other better. So how can we understand how others are perceiving or feeling a situation? Great. I think this is already a nice input of what is in the room. Um, so we'll definitely get back to that in the in the next steps. We actually like to go a little bit further in our and in, in picking your minds as participants on on what you had in what you consider then not only um, on on the benefits but what actually characterizes a cultural initiative that generates positive effects. So what's how would you describe a cultural initiative that can generate positive effects on social cohesion? Do you have any ideas there on what makes these cultural initiatives maybe different from others? what would typically allow a cultural initiative to generate a positive effect on social cohesion. So there again, if you have some keywords, that's great. And uh, don't hesitate to provide multiple keywords. Creative mind, bottom up, <laughs> fearless. <laughs> yes, so grassroots and bottom up is important, inclusive, immersive. Okay, accepting a certainty, so taking risks, I imagine. 
inclusive. Okay, already. So openness to difference, community involvement, of course, important. Human centered culture, civic participation, also. Transparency also in, um, we can get back to transparency of what, of decisions, of the real process, community involvement, participation, inclusion, come up as an important creativity. Initially that do not divide participants. Great, I think we are getting up to 20 and we have already a nice word cloud coming up, giving a nice picture of the types of characteristics. A few more seconds. I think we see a real pattern with the participation, community involvement. So this idea of, of this being a, a bottom-up, open, inclusive process and creative, of course, with creativity. Great. Thank you very much for this input. I think this gives a very nice backdrop to our first um, speaker, Lars Ebert, who is then um, Director of Cultural Action Europe and who will give us an update of policy developments um, regarding cultural policies and their um, relation to social cohesion. Please, Lars. Thanks very much, Eric. And uh, it's wonderful to be in the room, in the virtual room with uh, so many active and engaged participants. It was a nice exercise, I think, to see the word clouds coming up. And I'll try to refer to that a little bit um, during my presentation that I will share with you now, and I hope you can all see it. Um, I um, am afraid that I'll go a little bit through a maybe rather dry matter, but I know that we'll have uh, two presentations that really um, uh, will take us into more practice examples and hopefully we can link um, uh, some of some of the issues that I'll bring up uh, with the practice examples and vice versa, and fuel our conversation um, uh, on that on those with those links. Um, this is the structure of my presentation uh, that I'm intending to uh, go through in the next twenty minutes. Um, hopefully, not more. Um, I will introduce a little bit the organization I work for, where I'm Secretary General, Culture Action Europe. Just so you know, uh, you understand from what which, which position um, I'm I'm speaking to you and why I'm introducing then a row of reference points that we are working with, um, and um, I'm not only introducing these reference points because uh, they've been kind of bigger steps in the policy discussions that we may want to refer to a little bit later. Because, but because I think they are instruments that all of us somehow can use in our argumentations and in our daily work, uh, yeah, to build arguments uh, for uh, better support for cultural initiatives as levers for social cohesion. Um, I um, will um, give in each slide uh, also the link to the to the documents I'm mentioning. And I think we've agreed that the organizers will share the PowerPoint with all of you afterwards, just so you don't need to stress out, stress yourselves and typing, typing links or uh, or making notes. Um, you'll just receive the PowerPoints with the links so that you can just click through uh, the references in uh, in the respective websites. Um, I am uh, working for a network that is called Culture Action Europe. Uh, which is a mainly an advocacy network for the cultural sectors and fields in Europe. We are based in Brussels. Um, I'm logging in and speaking now from Brussels. Um, we are sometimes referred to as the network of the networks. When we were founded roughly 35 years ago, um, the back then emerging cultural networks across Europe um, came together in a sort of meta network in which they um, organized themselves to um, address um, uh, politics in Brussels mainly. 
But throughout the years, we've opened our membership for other organizations, um, cultural organizations across Europe, artists, activists, researchers, policymakers. And we have now roughly 220 members across Europe from very big um, international networks to national networks and community initiatives. I think that's the richness of our of our organization. And through that, uh, we feel we've got the agency to represent the diversity of the cultural sectors. I don't think we can fully represent all the opinions that are out there, uh, but I think the diversity is what makes us strong and that's represented within our network. Um, we believe that uh, the value and values of culture and its contribution to the development of sustainable and inclusive societies must be um, put at the heart of, of, of policymaking in Europe. And I think the important um, terms here in this vision statement is uh, the duality of value and values of culture, uh, which for us means that that culture needs to be seen um, in its own respect, needs support as its own sector, but has also values that cross cut through other sectors like healthcare, sustainable development, uh, community well-being, and so on. We believe um, that's a, a series of beliefs in our value system, so to speak, that uh, culture must be put at the heart of public debate and decision making. We are not an add on. We are not the cherry on the cake, uh, not the extra um, as it is now, unfortunately, um, uh, budget post in the in the annual budgets where there are remains um, that have not been divided across other fields. Uh, are given to us like bre breadcrumbs, but we should really be central in everything that is decided politically. Um, uh, the value and values of culture um, based on democracy, pluralism, inclusion, and cultural rights. Some of these terms have been um, also mentioned in the tag clouds. Um, we believe that culture contributes to the development of sustainable and inclusive societies. I think uh, when we try to make an argument uh, for the role of culture, that sustainability in the very broadest sense of our so societies is the key word. And we believe that culture is a practice rather than a resource. And I think when we uh, talk about um, communities, about participation, about inclusion, about a, a lot of the words that have been brought in by you already uh, in, the, in the tag clouds, I think it's important to stress culture as a practice. And um, that says something about how we look at, for instance, indicators that we want to look at in the conversation a little bit later. Um, let's see how I can click forward. That's why our mission is to advocate the arts and culture as a fundamental building block of a common future of Europe and beyond. And advocating is maybe in that sense a little bit of a more chic word for lobbying. I think we always try to avoid lobbying because lobby is done by the bad guys, but in, in reality, um, advocating means we, we are informing um, policies, we try to inform politicians, but by informing uh, politicians, we of course also try to influence political decision making towards a stronger support for culture. And there I think uh, advocating can also be read as lobbying. Um, I think networking is important for it, but especially knowledge creation and knowledge distribution and a little bit of that knowledge distribution I'm trying to do in the next few minutes. Um, we have a few strategic focuses in this period. Uh, they will not change fundamentally, but uh, a little bit as of next year. Uh, culture, health, and well-being is one strong focus. We've just published a major study, a scoping review of the impact of culture on individual and community well-being. I think that's a really, um, a really relevant uh, study with policy recommendations and conclusions um, that uh, might be uh, of relevance for all of you. Um, this is a link I haven't added in this, um, in this um, uh, presentation, and I'll put it in the chat a little bit later. Um, I think it relates a lot to what culture can do if it cooperates with uh, sectors like um, like healthcare and and well-being. Culture, environment, and sustainable development is a major major focus of our activities. Uh, we are looking, for instance, first and foremost, of to ourselves. Um, how can cultural networks that put an emphasis on mobility and exchange work in a more sustainable way and from there extend thinking about environmental sustainability and the role of culture 
uh, to all other fields um, of cultural production. And then the third uh, and really for us um, ongoing focus point also for the next work, uh, next next um, period of strategic focus is uh, working conditions in the cultural field, fair re remuneration of, of, of artists and cultural workers. We are working in a precarious sector where uh, payment is often not secured. We don't have long time contracts. Uh, all the short term thinking that we may get back to in our conversation later when we talk about uh, community impact and what culture can do for uh, social cohesion and why the full potential is not used is also reflected in the way we treat the workers in our sector. It's always very short term and therefore uh, impact is not really uh, guaranteed and also the well-being of our workers is not guaranteed. Um, we have a few uh, very obvious interlocutors, um, people that we speak with, of course, the EU institutions, the European Parliament, the Commission, the Council of Europe. And I think we can't separate the three of them. Um, at the moment, the European Parliament is, for instance, uh, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a almost first time initiative of the Parliament that they launch a, um, a legislative initiative, which normally comes from the European Commission. Um, the European Commission plays into that um, uh, together with the Council that needs to bring together the member states. And if they draw one line, we can get things done. It's a very complex, uh, complex field to, to interact, um, but uh, that's our reality. Next to, of course, the UNESCO that looks more on an international level, the Council of Europe and all the regional and local initiatives that are not in the main focus, but um, that are, of course, part of our conversation as well. Um, so how do we work? Uh, a lot of our work is uh, what we call um, decoding. Now, now here we, we, we speak of decoding, but I think it's also encoding. So we are decoding the political debate that's going on in Brussels, for instance, for our members. Uh, which means uh, often just simply translating policy language in normal human language, um, because um, what might be uh, very um, well understandable and accessible for policymakers is really code language for most of the cultural workers, and vice versa. Uh, so if we advocate the cultural field towards policymakers, we often encode the conversation that's going on in the cultural field into policy language, so decoding, encoding. Uh, we determine our position through open consultations with our members and more broadly with uh, events, surveys and uh, conversations with the cultural sectors uh, in working groups, but also just in, um, in, in other forms of consultations. And of course, we support our members um, with capacity building, with individual consultations and, um, and with projects where we bring them together to develop knowledge and capacity together. Um, we are also running campaigns. I mean, we are lobbying, so we 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 run campaigns. I'm mentioning two uh, here and uh, dive into the first one first: uh, a cultural deal for Europe. Uh, in this campaign that we are running together with the European Cultural Foundation and Europa Nostra, the network of heritage, the heritage network, uh, we basically uh, advocate for full inclusion of culture in the, in the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. Uh, and in a way, um, uh, align it with the European Green Deal, and the, and we call it a cultural deal because, in analogy with the Green Deal, we we are calling for a cultural deal for Europe to integrate mainstream culture, so to speak, uh, into all policy areas and see what role culture can play to create a more sustainable future for Europe. Uh, of course, supporting for cultural workers again, it's a main issue of us. And I've given it another color because I think that refers to uh, the theme of this seminar, upholding democracy and rights for values-based Europe through culture. And that uh, uh, democracy, uh, upholding democracy, and um, I would call it a cultural democracy um, is, and now I'm diving into the reference points uh, I want to give us for the conversation a little bit later. I'm diving into the, a series of reference points that we use in our work uh, to make an argument um, for a stronger uh, support for the cultural sector. Um, when we talk about um, uh, the role of communities and how they can be supported and how um, cultural in initiatives can, can be levers for social cohesion. I think the FARO Convention in 2005,
which was a, a convention on the value of cultural heritage, so not specifically culture broadly, uh, but uh, it was a sort of sea change because in this convention for the first time, we've been looking at identity and values, not, not only um, at, uh, or um, even further, the, the focus have shifted away from looking at the values for uh, belonging, for instance, or identity, but uh, this has helped us to look at culture and cultural heritage as a place of not only belonging, but becoming as a process. So not something we need to broaden access to or make sure that more people can identify and create a feeling of belonging, but to see it as a process uh, in which we engage in an ongoing process of becoming in which we need to build something together. So that kind of sh shifts the perspective towards a more co-creational perspective of what culture is, what it means for us, what heritage means for us, how we um, engage with heritage as a place in which we negotiate uh, our values and how we want to live together. Um, the, this convention um, defines uh, heritage communities as self-organized, self-managed, groups of individuals who are interested in progressive social transformation of relationships between people, places, and stories with an inclusive approach based on an enhanced definition of heritage. And I think that uh, sort of idea that we are not born into a heritage community to which we necessarily belong, um, but that we choose to belong and that we choose to build our uh, communities and our belongings is a very important um, shift of thinking that allows us to develop the notion of participation a little bit broader. Um, then a little bit closer in time, we are making a jump to 2021, um, an initiative that was that was initiated by Culture Action Europe and that was taken up by the Portuguese uh, presidency of the European Union in 2021. That has led to the Porto Santo Charter. I'm sure many of you are aware of the Porto Santo Charter. Um, which was for us only a beginning and a need to develop uh, the thought of cultural citizenship, cultural rights, heritage rights much further in the next years, um, uh, has led an important conversation about the role of institutions, policymakers, and individuals towards full cultural citizenship. Basically, uh, the conversations and the charter looks at two, it's a little bit black and white, but they are they are polarizing the uh, the discussion in Europe since uh, the 50s, basically, uh, between uh, uh, the discussion that has started from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, mainly under the heading of democratization of culture, which means uh, we were looking at how we can lower the threshold uh, to access culture, broaden uh, cultural participation in the sense of um, uh, accessing um, uh, culture and, and, and redesigning our, our cultural offers in a way that they speak to more and broader groups in our society. And then on the other side, really cultural democracy, which turns around a little bit uh, the top-down thinking of opening up from top-down and, and, and really um, empowering broad groups of citizens to co-design their cultural, their cultural offers and their cultural activities. And I think uh, that is maybe uh, the one word that I found striking that no one um, uh, no one uh, typed it in in the first slide of the of the little exercise we did at the beginning. Um, someone typed share, and I think share is a key word. But but sharing somehow uh, implies that we share our power, and that's maybe the power of um, designing programs and running institutions, governing institutions and also co-authoring content and co-creating. I think that those are key words that um, I would maybe add to that slide and to our conversation a little bit later. I think the Porto Santo Charter is really worthwhile while reading. It ends with three sets of recommendations, recommendations for citizens, uh, recommendations for organizations and uh, recommendations for policymakers. I'll roughly run you through the recommendations for policymakers. I'm not going to read them out completely, but just to give you a, a sense uh, of uh, the direction in which, which they are taking. Um, it's um, 
of course, about cross-sectorial action plans. Here, uh, we are mentioning education and culture because without cultural education from an early age, uh, that agency to co-design uh, culture um, is very difficult to achieve. So, so we need uh, a cross-sectorial um, plan to support um, that cultural democracy. Then we need long-term action plans. I think um, uh, if, with everything we talk about, value and cultural diversity, empowering diversity, giving voice, um, everything that basically was uh, came up as buzzwords in the word clouds in the beginning uh, needs long-term approaches. The way we are funding culture now and the way we are looking at the impact of culture on communities is all short-term based. We are looking at projects of one year, two years, three years, four years at most. And we are expecting in that period uh, to achieve uh, to achieve measurable impact that is often quantitatively measurable. Um, if we um, apply trust, another word that was <laughs> big in the word crowd, cloud, uh, we need um, a trust in, an, in, in cultural activities that go beyond project thinking. So I think we uh, really need to uh, rethink our and not only our indicators, but also the way we structure funding programs, a, a little bit away from our project-based thinking. Um, uh, I, I mentioned that already, not only value uh, quantitative indicators, um, a, a nice um, reference here is the Indicator Framework on Culture and Democracy published by the Council of Europe in 2016 already, something that has not been acted upon until now, or not significantly at least. Um, then participation um, and uh, funding participation of underrepresented groups. I'll get back to the uh, to the to the challenge <clears throat> of understanding what participation really means a little bit later uh, in a in a later slide. And I'm kind of um, uh, speeding up a little bit uh, to um, get through everything in time. Uh, we need to uh, really map pu public cultural institutions that work for the promotion of a participatory culture. Maker spaces are in in incredibly uh, important, or not only maker spaces, but purely giving space to communities uh, without much preconditions uh, to um, to empower themselves and and take the co-authorship of um, uh, of uh, uh, um, creating cultural offers that are there for more people. Uh, to answer the question how to be many um, emancipatory projects um, amateurs uh, support for amateur activities is equally important um, okay uh, i've already mentioned the value of education um, we need to introduce uh, in a transdisciplinary integrated manner into compulsory curriculums uh, from uh, the uh, early age education to higher education, uh, uh, cultural literacy and cultural agency, that's um, a precondition uh, if we want to work on empowered communities. Um, then training programs for, for everyone that is working in the field already, for us basically, for, for, for the generation that is already you know, way into, uh, into an experienced uh, uh, cultural worker's career. Um, and then digital skills, of course, um, they are they are everywhere. Um, the next reference, uh, and I'm sorry for going so fast now, is uh, a manifesto that the cultural sector has drafted uh, at our last year, year annual conference in Elefsina in June. One of their chapters, it's, it's a manifesto on care that um, scrutinizes the ethics of care versus the ethics of justice. Um, where we look at not, not only how we can be treat everyone equally, but with equity, and to reach that equity, I think the ethics of care are really important. I'm not going to read that out to you. The link is there. Uh, you can uh, surf to it uh, a little bit later. Uh, now, this one um, is um, I want to I want to stand still with this uh, reference uh, for a minute. Uh, a study that has recently uh, been launched, um, uh, a EU study, Culture and Democracy, the evidence, how citizens' participation in cultural activities enhances civic engagement, democracy, and social cohesion. So uh, there was in the introduction already uh, mentioned that we need evidence to talk, uh, to talk with those that fund us, with those that create uh, um, policies about our impact. Now, this is a study that is even called the evidence. 
Um, I've been at a launch uh, at one of the launches of the studies uh, very recently, beginning of September uh, at the Europa Nostra conference. Um, and um, I was, of course, positively um, surprised that the study is there, that we can reference to it. But I was also equally, um, how do you call it, irritated, maybe? I don't want to be too strong here. But there, mm -hmm. that, uh, the, um, that the uh, notion of participation that is handled in this study is still a notion that I would rather um, uh, put at the lower end of Einstein's letter of participation, which is rather uh, being mildly active in, in, in cultural activities. Um, participating in a cultural offer that is um, designed in a way that it is easier for me to participate. But it doesn't go all the way to the other end of the spectrum, which is uh, to co-create uh, cultural offers together. And I think there um, we may need another study, uh, another evidence. Uh, but again, I actually think that the practitioners out there are evidence enough that uh, real participation has an impact, a positive impact on, on, on social cohesion and community engagement and the sense of belonging, togetherness, and everything uh, that we see as, in, as a value for a more inclusive society. Um, uh, then just a little uh, beacon of hope, uh, and maybe I'll read that out because it's really, uh, really, um, wonderful actually, that um, at the last uh, informal meeting of all the cultural ministers of Europe in Spain, in Cáceres, 25th of uh, September, they've launched a joint declaration, the Cáceres Declaration, that is um, emphasizing the values of culture from the, from the glue value, so to speak, or the value that we've seen in the pandemic but going all the way to the value it can have to counter fragmentation of our societies, populism, anti-democratic movements, and everything that was mentioned in the, in the introduction already. Um, and I'll just read that little uh, excerpt here. From this city that is a World Heritage Site, we pledge to work to make culture a crucial element of policies promoting peaceful, fair, and egalitarian societies, because culture plays an essential role in the construction of democratic societies, and in the personal development of citizens. Culture is essential for achieving societies that are healthier, fairer, freer, more dis discerning, tolerant, inclusive, and egalitarian. That is why, without preempting the coming post-2030 discussions, we are committed to working for culture to be recognized in and of itself as a new sustainable development goal. I think this is really uh, groundbreaking. It doesn't mean that policies, pol policies will change immediately, but I think it is something that we can um, that we can uh, hold back to their faces, so to speak, uh, in the next years to come. Also, uh, uh, after the parliament elections next year, when a new commission will be designed and when uh, the Council of Europe will have a key role in designing uh, the, the policy discussion for the next four years. Uh, then... Um, I'll just have a last slide in which I will share a link with you for a proposal that uh, we, of course, have prepared with Culture Action Europe and other organizations that, that you can see very, very small uh, in, these, in these little logos, uh, a proposal for a zero draft of a cultural goal that we could add as an 18th sustainable development goal value especially that uh, value uh, expressing especially that value of culture that the ministers have also uh, formulated roughly in their declaration but then with a with a very concrete wording that would go in analogy with the other 17 sustainable development goals um that leaves us with a few questions and i think they are complementary with the questions that eric uh, um, has uh, provided for us in the discussion already how can we shift the focus to soft infrastructure and participation rather than traditional approaches prioritizing hard infrastructure how can we strengthen participatory method methodologies intercultural mediation and new evaluation frameworks to measure social impact and engagement and ultimately how can we change the narrative of, of culture as an add-on towards culture as a central part of the sustainable development of our societies? And with this, um, I will um, leave it to uh, our follow-up speakers to add meat on the on these dry 
um, policy bones. And I'm really very much looking forward to a conversation with all of you. Here are my contact details just to get in touch if you want to. And I'll stop sharing here. Thank you very much, Lars. Um, I see there are not so many questions coming up yet in the in the chat. I was personally very, I thought it very interesting the the level of ambition you put participation. I just from my experience in many projects, I've seen we have we somehow have internalized that a few people carry cultural initiatives and the other are expected to just come and attend or, as you say, have a very low level of participation. And maybe that's internalized in many respects. I'm just struck. I have a question on on what when we say we talk a lot about democrat democratization of culture and and I just feel that often in the cultural this, these documents you're referring to it's democratic if everyone attends if if you have lots of people really be participating then we say it's democratic. Um, in other fields of policy making, like social policy or local development, we th we say it's democratic if it's somehow legitimized by elected bodies. And we have another perspective that institute the relation between institutions and and individuals is thought a bit differently. And I'm just wondering if there's some potential clash there on on how we approach and the relation between individuals and and institutions in culture as opposed to other policy fields, because we don't feel the relation in the same way. And maybe also because the idea that elect politicians would decide what art should create creates a lot of other issues. So I wonder if you have any any comments there on the notion of democracy as we are now precisely going, looking at this, this field from culture to social or from culture to territories, how the notion of democracy can maybe be a bit tricky to, yeah. to really work oh, it's with. A, it, it's, it's a great question. Uh, and I, and I, um, I'm, I'm rather um, an optimist here and I don't see, I don't see that, that clash necessarily. Uh, I'm a great believer uh, in civil society as a pillar of of of, of democratic development and, and and democratic processes. I think um, civil society representation should and must go hand in hand with democratically elected representation that um, has a clear mandate uh, for legislation for uh, making the circumstances in which we as individuals live better on the long run. But um, to fill these frameworks with life and with content, a civil society um, is, is key. And um, sometimes um, in between elections, long times are passing and, uh, and, and, and elected representatives uh, should need to be held accountable for what's going on uh, in society. And of course, we've got a right to demonstrate in all that hard politics. But at the same time, when we, when we look at the narratives that are that shape our lives, like you mentioned, the pandemic. You know, uh, there are things happening in people's lives uh, that uh, go back to people who were writing in the chat, meaning making. Um, uh, what provides a meaning of life for me if I live in a deprived neighborhood? How do I tell my story? How do I make my story heard? And and I think. Um, their um, civil society processes through civil society organizations, through neighborhood centers, through simply opening up a room where a group of people can meet and sing together or discuss together and write a banner and hang it on front of, in front of the house that the neighbors see it and politicians see it, up to my own organization, which is an organiz a civil society organization where those who want gather and discuss and formulate a position that I can bring to the attention of elected politicians and inform them in a bottom-up process. It's, it's something very similar than the singing that's happening at the corner uh, of my street down here. Um, so I think it's not a contradiction. Uh, I think it's a compulsory um, coexistence. Thank you. I see there is one comment. Maybe we can look at the, the connection, Mart, if you yeah. <laughs> like. Yeah, no, the comment is about cultural also having an economic role in, in city centers and elsewhere. So just, um, I think we will address this, especially later with the Diogo's uh, presentation on LX Factory from Lisbon. And we certainly have some good practices to share uh, after the session as well. But also I wanted to thank Lars for this very insightful presentation. I especially like that you emphasized that one of the recommendations from this uh, uh, Porto Santo charter about the need for um, cross-sectoral action plans and especially education and culture. This is something 
uh, we also saw uh, in Estonia, where I'm based at, when we were involved in, uh, let's say, a research that was supposed to craft policy recommendations for the Ministry of Culture. Uh, mm -hmm. And this was a process done with uh, stakeholders in the field. And in the end, I would say that every second or third recommendation somehow actually fed into the educational policy. And in, and but it was awkward to recommend these to the Ministry of Culture because that's in the you know uh, this in the space of the Ministry of Education instead. So definitely, I think um, fully agree with that. That you and, and appreciate that you also had made it in bold in your presentation. But my question is is actually what you mentioned uh, on the sidelines that you had also recently done a study on uh, culture impact of culture on community well being. Um, and I understand it also uh, community well being also as in health. Uh, so. Do you remember any good, uh, some example or some inf insightful fact from this study that the, you mentioned that you could also share with us? Um, um, good that you remind me. I'll share the study with you in the in the chat uh, in, a, in in a few minutes. Um, and we've we've collected. Um, we did a scoping review, which means we we have looked. Uh, the WH the World Health Organization has published uh, their last study on the impact of culture and health in two thousand nineteen. Uh, we've complemented that with with uh, scientific articles that have um, been published since 2019 until uh, 2023. So um, it's more than 3,000 peer-reviewed articles that we've brought together and, and analyzed. Um, at the same time, we've looked at case studies across Europe where um, where um, art-based initiatives and health-based initiatives work together and and, and explore complementarities, which. Uh, which uh, range from an example in Denmark, where um, an artist collective has um, has designed uh, apartments that represent um, uh, time uh, time time jumps to the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s to visit for Alzheimer patients uh, that measurably calms them down for three to six weeks, where normally which we had. Uh, significantly reduced the need to uh, to give uh, tranquilizers uh, to these patients, uh, where where you could see that uh, you know uh, uh, medical and cultural activities can can be can be mutually beneficial, up to uh, 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 studies where the impact of singing uh, for postnatal mothers with postnatal dis depression. Um, uh, I mean, those are very simplistic short term examples i'm i'm hesitant to mention them because i'm 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 always advocating for the long term impact to see how uh, you know how how long term community engagement in communities in care homes can have long term impact but there are a lot of examples that uh, in that study are highlighted um and and well i'm i'm happy to share them with you um maybe maybe can i can i maybe um, make one um <laughs> Go to the go to the economic um, comment that was made because I have a suspicion why why someone would maybe um, bring in the the economic um, aspect because it's um, I see that in in our network uh, at many of our members that we are using economic uh, the economic impact as a as an argument to invest more you know um, how much do we contribute to the gross national product uh, to employability of our sector uh, to 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 workforce and so on um and and that's totally relevant but um i think we've been pushed into that corner to argument like that that's the one corner we've been pushed in the other corner is the identity corner to argument with uh, cultural heritage and our identity because you know the populism has pushed us to argue like that and liberalism has pushed us to argue uh, in the in the economic uh, way. But I think we should now dare to kind of really also get back to old uh, old fashioned um, uh, social uh, social equality thinking and, and say, no, 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 culture is an investment that doesn't pay off immediately in the next three years. Uh, it's an investment that pays off on a longer term and that is for the health of society and democracies and it's not for return on investment. Good. I th thank you very much, Lars. I think the next presentation will really provide other, also other perspectives on how combinations between economic benefits and social benefits. We'll move on to Caroline and her presentation, uh, providing also nice illustrations of your questions of how. How can you change the cultural focus? How can you work on participation, on soft measures um, in the specific then context of tourism promotion? 
with a focus on generating lively creative communities. And if I understood Caroline correctly, I think these lively communities are actually the product. But can we say that? They are? Well, anyway, I'll let Caroline jump into her presentation and maybe then tell me what she thinks about this notion of communities as a tourism product. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you very much to you all. I'm oh, sorry, just had to go back to the first. Uh, I'm very pleased and honored to be to be with you today. Uh, also, I have to say I'm a little bit concerned because I accepted the challenge to present all this uh, topic in only eight minutes. So, uh, well, let's start and, and let's discuss them if you if you want. Uh, just to be sure that you can see the presentation. Yeah. So let's just let me know. Um, well, I propose to see tourism not just uh, and not at all uh, on the opposite as a problem, as we used to hear from uh, different destinations around the world, especially in Europe, but uh, as a solution and more precisely creative tourism. So uh, if we focus on the concept of creative territories and especially uh, with the reference of Charles Landry, we know that creative territories have to include part of hardware, which are the equipments and especially cultural equipment uh, and logistic, but also what makes the difference are really the software, which are the DNA, the cultural identity of the place, the know-how, the intangible heritage and so on, which mean the people. So don't know still uh, if we can uh, say them that they are the product, but let's see. And the augware, which is the way we're going to organize, we're going to manage all these human resources in order to create value for the territories through tourism. So that's why creative tourism is like a piece of this puzzle. And uh, we're going to see some example in this presentation. First of all, I would like to remind what we mean by creative tourism. So from the creative tourism network uh, I represent, we rely on the official definition as the concept was defined by the professors Gregritus and Crispin Raymond in the 2000, which at this moment uh, perceived that there was a big uh, change in tourism that was not just about mainstream, but there were more and more travelers who wanted to stay their travels in order to develop their own creativity by participating in participat participatory uh, activities and experiences which contribute, which help them to uh, learn better, above all, to understand better the local culture. And we're going to see that it is about the very specific and very local culture, not uh, anymore about uh, general promotion that uh, it was done by the National Tourist Board during decades. So what is very interesting for us, it is that it is not uh, about a fashion train, it is completely a societal change, which means that we passed from the 40s economy uh, and its equivalent, that was the, the 40s tourism, which means a very standard tourism, to uh, the emergence of new economies uh, and this disruption. So makes appear the experience economy, the circular economy, the creative economy that is very developed, and especially in South America, and the sharing economy. And all these paradigm shifts uh, led to new values among the society, uh, much more ethic, much more ecological, much more uh, in, in the line of the search of meaning, which uh, of course provoked a, a disruption in the tourism. And we passed from a vocational tourism, which was like the far niente, to vocational tourism, which means that in the reality, in the facts, when we are a, a destination, uh, this is also a change for us because it is not just about uh, selecting a destination for the holidays among the top ranking, the 10 uh, best or the 10 most visited uh, cities, but we have to be attractive for these new travelers who will uh, choose us because we can propose them very different kind of experiences and very meaningful and very in line with uh, their value. So that's a little bit the, our focus and our strategy uh, with the creative friendly levels uh, destination that highlight for uh, all this uh, ecosystem they have uh, created. And that's all in line with the new demand because we see uh, tour operators like this, like this, this one, uh, which focus on crafts and hobbies. And by the way, uh, the question they ask you when you enter the website is, 
where does your passion take you? So, which means that you don't have an um, previous idea about the destination, but depending on if you are interested in drawing, in embroidering, in gardening, jewelry, or so on, they will give you a list of destinations which are positioned for this kind of tourism. And that's very interesting because it means that we don't have to have the Eiffel Tower in our territory to attract tourists. We just have to think about all the know-how and the tradition we, we can uh, share with them. So like this, uh, in craft, we can see that there are this kind of uh, travel agencies in all the sectors. Uh, you can, for instance, participate in the carnival in Tenerife, in the Canary Island, not as a spectator, but you can go uh, maybe one or two weeks before with your family, with your friends, with your colleagues, and learn uh, the choreography. You can learn how to make your, uh, your clothing for the carnival. And you can, of course, participate in the parade of the carnival. And things like this are in all the sectors. Uh, stay specific to learn how to knit in all the places of the world. So you will change, of course, uh, the know-how, the textile and so on, but uh, you will gather with communities who will share your same passion uh, around the world. And of course, as well, gastronomy, uh, dance and so on. So that really show us that this is a reality. And this is not just about a niche because these days, for instance, are no less than 3,000 uh, euros for a stay that just include the activities to which you have to add the flights as well. So that's very important for the territory to be aware of the potential of the opportunities they have in developing this kind of activity. And especially because, as I said, uh, this demand is more focused on intangible, on human values, uh, with a high budget, and especially what is very interesting as well in order to fight against uh, negative externalities of tourism, they propose long stay out of season and throughout the territories. So uh, over tourism is, of course, excluded from this kind of, of tourism. And also another important point that we convert the tourism into uh, ambassadors of the destination. So that means that through this tourism, we will not only generate new incomes and new uh, economical uh, activity for the, for the territories, but also to create an ecosystem. So we all know that uh, talking about ecosystem is talking about how to reach the sustainable development goals and in this way, we're going to see that naturally we're going to reach the social cohesion, the intangible heritage recovery, uh, the unseasonality and so on, and the creation of jobs and, and, and many more. And that's because uh, this paradigm shift may change, may pass from a top-down model in which we had the tourist industry that imposed uh, a unique or a standard uh, offer to the tourists in general, to another model in which we have this traveler who has very specific needs, who uh, who reach who who achieve to impose its demands to the the tourism sector. But who is the tourism sector? We know that the travel agent won't be able to uh, teach how to make embroidery, so we'll have to co-create with dream makers who are uh, artists, artisan, farmer, fisherman, merchant who have. Uh, this knowledge and who will uh, make this dream come true for the tourists. And that's very uh, specific and that will lead naturally as well to uh, the creation of this ecosystem because we have uh, all these natural, cultural, creative and human resources which come from the associative sector, from craft sectors, from CCIs, but also for the tourism industries that will together create these experiences that at their turn will reflect the DNA, which means that, of course, we won't create experiences that not correspond to uh, the local culture. But on the opposite, we're going to recover maybe disappearing uh, heritage through, through these uh, experiences. So that uh, leads to a new system, to a new model of co-creators of uh, the tourism industry. And the next, uh, the, the, the up level of this uh, chain is also, well, the, the network of the destinations among them. That would mean that they will no longer compete to know 
uh, which destination is in the top ranking, but they will contribute to be prescriptor themselves to the other in order to generate this, uh, this uh, mobility of travelers. So I've been asked to present success stories and especially uh, this one, I would like to make you uh, guess where we are, but uh, well, due to the time, I will give you the answer. We are here in uh, Ibiza. So I'm pretty sure that uh, you all know Ibiza. Maybe you've been, maybe not, but at least you have a completely different image of Ibiza, much more uh, certainly focused on clubbing, on uh, summer season and fiesta. And that's precisely uh, the counterbalance, the council of Ibiza, uh, decided to give years ago, uh, that's why before COVID, when we worked with them, in order precisely not to touch uh, the model of the summer uh, tourism in Ibiza that was already built on private initiatives and so on, but to uh, seize all the uh, natural and cultural resources, which was not a touristization because the Ibiza people, the, the people who live there uh, all year long, are still participating in this uh, traditional celebration. This was not just, uh, this was not something thought for the tourists, but they decided to uh, create experiences in order to extend the season and to attract tourists uh, on the low season. So uh, these tourists that we call creative tourists can be a single uh, travel agency, seniors, team building, women travelers community, kids friendly and so on. But uh, at least we give them new purpose to go to Ibiza in the low season, which would not be the case if we would just uh, count on the on the sea because uh, it's not uh, so warm to, to to enjoy it. So that's our some uh, experience. Thank you, thank you very much, Caroline. Yeah. I think we have. <laughs> you've been very efficient in yeah. in in conveying the whole the whole rationale. I think we'll have to stop on the on the cases, unfortunately, okay. because we will be running out of time. I think this was very interesting already. No Gave problem. us a great overview. Thanks a lot. Um, I understand. Yeah, you can of course run through, and we can yeah. see the images of of the all. I uh, also interesting to see a city like Cannes, which you ran through there, and bigger cities are also concerned. I think that the, I the message is above all to know that uh, it is a model that can be adaptable to all kinds of uh, of destination and uh, and topics. Great, thank you very much. Personally, I get when I listen to you, I get the vibe. This seems a bit crazy. How can this be become any become any more than a small niche? But I think crazy things are what the future is made of. I mean, before the COVID epidemic, we had also many. Oh, this the future of the COVID would, would seem unrealistic and un impossible, and it happened. And and uh, yes, I if I don't see so many questions coming up right now already in the chat. But I do. In general, my my first question is: Do you see? The perspective for this going beyond a niche tourism is there a dialogue with with mainstream tourism or or how how does it does it maybe interact how do the the different forms of tourism interact or maybe not interact how how do you see the process maybe of making this more of a of a mass phenomenon a transformation of tourism well we can see that naturally there is like i don't know if we can um say call it uh, education but at least we see that uh, mainstream tourism people who were used to uh, just having a, a conventional kind of tourism with visits and at the mosque uh, are now also experiences this kind of activities so uh, maybe they are not the one who will cross the planet just because uh, with the purpose of uh, taking part in a in a percussion masterclass but uh, they are also including this kind of, uh, of offer. And we, uh, at the same time, of course, see uh, one of the major tour operators that are developing uh, lines and specific catalogs of this kind of activities. So we can see that uh, we are in this, uh, in this line. And uh, precisely the challenge is to uh, go until this mainstream uh, but uh, really guaranteeing the, the quality and the authenticity of the experiences. So that's why our, for instance, our organization acts as an in-between between the industry and, uh, and the CCIs and uh, cultural sector. Great. I don't know, Lars, if, uh, Mark, sorry, if anything else has come up. Um, no, we still, we don't have anything new in the chat, but I can um, ask from my side, because you had this slide where you showed 
the connection between cultural purism and SDGs. Yeah. And I was wondering, have you also uh, have put measurements behind it or, or that how does each activity can contribute to the goals of, of the SDGs? So is it just, let's say, is it on a feeling level that it contributes all around? Or do you have metrics uh, in, in place to also measure how, how you actually impact the different SDGs? Well, there are metrics, uh, and especially we, we collaborate with uh, Professor Greg Richard. So, so I, I really um, suggest to, uh, to, to read his uh, extensive uh, work on this because uh, we are like um, retrofitting uh, our, our, our work. Um, and also what I had in, an, in another slide was uh, some balance made, for instance, by the city of Lole in south of uh, Portugal, in which uh, they started with the program of creative tourism, so creating experiences just to commercialize them for the, for the tourists. And very quickly, uh, I mean, in a, in a time of one year, maybe, they uh, decided to create a hub for, uh, for creative industry, for design especially, and had some results in terms of uh, job creation in sectors that were that were quite disappearing, like uh, carpet mills, like uh, uh, well, all the, this uh, this tradition and traditional offices that were disappearing. So that's our very important point to see how uh, through this uh, kind of offer we can also redynamize uh, sectors that were disappearing. Thank you very much, Caroline. We'll move on now to Lisbon and Diogo, who will talk about a new oil space that was created in Lisbon for creation and for social interaction in an abandoned industrial site. Uh, so this is essentially an urban reconversion project, but and it was it had a private entity in the driver's seat. Um, and we have asked to look to Diego to have a closer look at the role of culture and creative activities in making this project successful and on its positive social effects. So Diego, please, the floor is yours. You're muted. Hello, everyone. Hope you can hear me well. Um, I'm going to, to present you one of the best practices of the Interreg Europe project CREOP, uh, which was Alex Factory. Alex Factory is an um, industrial complex that was abandoned and was recovered uh, step by step to become a cultural hub. It, it dated from 1846. It was a, a, a fabric um, building doing all types of um, tissues and, and products for the, um, for the country and also for exploitations. It was it had many different uses through through the times. It became a, a cereal factory, then a typography, and it became abandoned. In two thousand five, two thousand eight, with um, uh, the recession that we that we had in, in Europe and in Portugal in specific, it was um, sold, and the company that that bought it uh, had plans for for developing it. But in the meanwhile, with uh, with this recession. The recession it, it was very difficult to start building new new construction for either residential or for commercial real estate so they decided to to use it and give it a, a purpose while they were waiting for for the development to, to happen the site actually uh, spread to 23000 square meters uh, and had several buildings they were mostly in good condition they have some small ones that were uh, in, in ruins, basically. Uh, this is uh, the floor plan. All, all those buildings had different utilities and they were conserved to become some uh, common areas with food courts and uh, co-work spaces, small shops, canteens, but some of them were just left empty for, for some, some events. This, this happened by phases, of course. It was a huge space. Uh, they they first start intervening in the structure and the um, the, the infrastructure uh, floor by floor and there was only uh, works in the common areas the 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 rent spaces and the the private spaces were left untouched so the persons that the the, the companies that would come in would actually um, do that rehab and and turn them into the place they they wanted it to be 
the background was kept, so it, it kept the, the look as an industrial state with the same characteristics, all the industrial equipment and some of the cars were, were still there. So some of the machinery was deactivated, cleaned, but was not removed. So there was a lot of heavy machine, uh, heavy machinery still inside the, the building. Of course, the, the, the looks had to change. So uh, a lot of artists were, were invited to come and, and paint the walls, uh, do what they could to 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 bring that that old building to to life, and there were more than two hundred artists and projects um, appearing and and presenting their work, and this just brought the the entire building to to art, and they become a festival that was happening every year. Nowadays, we actually have very famous artists in Portugal, like this one, Burdal the Second which turns garbage into really valuable and appreciated street art. This is, this is one of them. And um, becoming more and more popular, they actually introduced new uh, events like the Alex Market, bringing secondhand uh, clothes, crafts, um, products from, from around to, the, to this vibrant area of the, of the city. It happens every Sunday, like many fairs in the um, in Europe, but in Portugal they they mostly disappeared, in from city city centers even more, and they grew a lot in size, uh, to more than sixty souls, two thousand visitors, and they they keep growing. Also, very important, another source of income for the for the manager and for the rehabilitation were the events. So. Events need mostly floor and uh, and the roof to 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 happen, uh, and they had two large warehouses with uh, fifteen hundred square meters and a thousand square meters each, and they used for events. So you can see some examples on the on the right hand side with the proper lighting and renting everything from the outside. They could actually become um, amazing venues and and still keep the the deep heritage that they they had that was deeply appreciated and events like master chef and and many others were were happening um all the time another important um projects were the the cornerstone projects this is one example which is called Lit Vagar. it's a it's a bookstore so this is one of the first um residents that was was there uh, the, the amount of revenue that the bookstore brings to the space uh, that it actually takes inside Alex factory uh, is of course not commercially valuable probably there's more money coming out of the cafeteria than the 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 book selling in the the, the bookstore but this was one of the cornerstones that was attracting a lot of a lot of tourists a lot of people to Alex factory to see this bookstore and then get to know the rest there were some other um, important uh, landmarks, like some some of the the canteens that were there were very very multicultural, very inclusive, and this this was very important for the the, the ecosystem to work to have these these cornerstone projects that were uh, always at the center of Alex Factory, and. Connecting uh, all, all of this with, with the, the thematic of today and what Lars said before, uh, Alex Factory actually is a, it's a good example. And as the Porto Santo Charter emphasizes, the, the importance of this cultural democracy involves this active participation and inclusivity of the, the, the residents. Even the people that have a store or have something inside uh, Alex Factory were involved in bringing it to life on doing the rehab when they first went there painting the the walls getting some street art and alex factory actually is, is a is a place that embodies these principles uh, it's a space where artists entrepreneurs and the public interact collaborate and even change the the entire building uh, on their own and as well the charter calls for this cross-sexual action uh, plan involving these stakeholders and alex factory was a, a good example of that involving all of that and and the, the municipality as well by allowing it to turn into this this type of uh, of project um is also an example on all the private initiative the development and the the real estate uh, plans for developing that land become a, a cultural hub and a very vibrant place of course this also 
the success also brings some some challenges and when you have success things become more expensive more difficult to get in and that happened of course uh, and it become more and less more difficult to get in and less affordable for new artists to to come in but of course around alex factory new places are appeared and actually provide different uh, offers and and also complements the one alex factory had and when the when one place becomes too expensive or too crowded, another one will of course appear and complement that. I'm available for questions with one of the last uh, pictures in one of the nicest restaurants of Felix Factory uh, with a nice view to the river. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diego. I think this last point you made on, on the fact that the, the building in a way that it was very creative, it was very attractive for artists and for cultural activities in the intermediate period before it became too popular. And that these temporary spaces are a key to artistic creation and to cultural activities is a message you can take on board. And then the question is whether you think there is a some kind of learning, some kind of uh, learning of how you deal with these spaces that can be taken on board for the next steps and that uh, some people accumulate knowledge on, on how this is done in cities or maybe in other territories also. <clears throat> Sorry, how you use these intermediate, temporary available, tempor rarely available uh, buildings and infrastructure. I would say that one of the learnings is actually that the process is is the the important part because you can only start from scratch in a building and build a community from scratch once because it, it will not be the same when you enter something that someone already idealized already painted the walls already defined it defined the thematic um and the important part is the process how to get a framework that you can actually uh, repeat and move to another part of the city that actually needs this revitalization, needs new people to go there. And that's one of the, the, the learnings that we have here. It's about the process. Not the, there's nothing special about those buildings. It's, it's the way the community brought it together. Thanks, Diogo. I don't know, Mart, if, you, if there are any questions coming up or... Um... No, but I, I find this topic very interesting. Because I've seen it also in other parts of Europe uh, when first the, the early movers or the early tenants are artists, creatives who need workshop space uh, and don't mind the, well, maybe not to up to standard premises. They want to create, they want to break things, they want to you know, pay low rent. And then when things become very gentrified, then it's always a decision for also the place managers, you know, do we uh, raise the rent and we know that we're going to lose these people and maybe a part of the original identity. Or, or do we keep them on board? And I think different solutions are used uh, elsewhere. But I liked how Diego emphasized that it's always an opportunity to revitalize a new part of town uh, that uh, where they go and create a new ident identity somewhere else. Um, and having visited the Delix factory myself as a tourist, it was a nice sight. So I was happy, happy to see some um, fun uh, pictures that brought up fun memories for, for myself. Um, but otherwise, Eric, I, I suggest we go to this panel part that we invite Caroline and Lars back uh, to the discussion yes. table. Very good. If Caroline and Lars, if you can come back, I, I would maybe have a first question for for Lars now. Having we've gone through the the big European politics, now we've gone down to a, a specific tourism network. We've looked at a specific site in Lisbon, so different levels. How does that echo what you said in the beginning? Did you, did you find inspiration or or illustrations you would like to highlight in what you heard later, Lars? Yes, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I was um, very happy and thanks very much for, for both of you for presenting these examples because they exactly exemplify what these dry uh, policy reference frameworks um, try to support or at least, um, you know, underpin. Um, um, I mean, in uh, what 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 Caroline has has presented um, is 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 an amazing amazing model, and I I think you uh, mentioned in one of the slides because it recreates an ecosystem for the region uh, that that approach, and and I think that ecosystemic thinking is something that I somehow also see back in the LX factory, and maybe that would lead me to a sort of question that I would have. Well, um, uh, do to Diego about well the governance model and the sustainability and not only giving in to the sort of 
forces of gentrification and kind of um, accepting the fate and carry on to the next uh, desolated uh, factory and and start from scratch, but maybe really thinking how that ecosystem, as Caroline described it, can be turned from a into a sort of permaculture where where we can maybe see how the commercial aspects and the idealistic aspects, the community aspects, the I don't know the uh, the urban development aspects can be mutually beneficial, uh, like in a in a permaculture with big trees and the small trees and the mosses and all all that kind of. Um, uh, are there to support each other, um, and and maybe the other question I would have to Caroline um, is, I mean, for instance, I've I've been noting titles like this stitching, and I forgot now the stitch. There was an image about a stitching uh, stitching topia or something like that, where I imagine that part of an experience as a tourist is that I can that I can learn a stitching technique, which I which would be intangible heritage of a region, and which is probably carried on by a very small group of um, people, supposedly women, that traditionally stitch. Uh, and, and for me, the question would be, what role does that community of stitching women, for instance, have in the, in the ecosystem in the end? Are they part of designing the offer to the tourists? Um, are, they, are they a service provider? I mean, in how far, you know, I'm getting back to that perma, permaculture approach again, where where everyone has their own agency in a in a in a bigger system that um, uh, is supporting itself, um, if that makes sense. I mean, it's the same question to both of you somehow, but that question uh, reflects that it's it 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 resonates very much with the participatory thinking that I tried to highlight. Maybe Caroline first, because I, I but I don't hear you now. You I think you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Uh, well, I, I think that the key, uh, as I said, is on the way we do it and on the process uh, we do in order for them to hold these uh, communities. We think about, uh, yeah, this old woman, because theoretically they are the one who own all this knowledge and, and, uh, and can transfer it. But of course, it can be a lot of uh, profile of this kind. And uh, in the way we accompany them, to uh, convert themselves into entrepreneur. And I think that that's really the key because it is not about uh, Zool uh, that we, we started working with destination in which they say, okay, but we don't uh, precisely uh, to go further from this, uh, this model of do that happened in some destinations. Uh, and we want really to empower these communities. Empower them means that uh, we don't want to convert uh, these women or craftsmen or farmers into uh, travel agents or tourist entrepreneurs, because for most of them, and especially if we talk about artists uh, who have another soul, another another way of, of uh, perceiving life, um, of course, they won't accept to, to completely change. But what we can offer them is the way to uh, balance their activity throughout the year in order to complete it. Uh, in low season, for instance, with this kind of activity uh, that will maintain their authenticity, that will be really in line with their, their thought, but uh, that can be a complement as well to their, to their activity. And that path by, uh, by empowering them and by converting them in these uh, very, well, uh, uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, we are working in, in projects around the world and in any kind of uh, background and in context, I think that the process in the, is the same. Uh, for instance, now we were, well, it's not Europe, but in, in uh, Tunisia. And uh, it is fantastic to see how this agriculture, who uh, for most of them are women, uh, really uh, follow the process and are now completely autonomous in, in this field and can uh, deal with tourists in B2C, but also in B2B with travel agents who want to uh, integrate this kind of activity. So that's that's really the way uh, to do this. Great. So I, I'm I might add that the, this this temporary characteristic of these things uh, it's it's really important because we had two two sides one that the 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 owner decided to just clean it and leave it completely flat with zero buildings and wait for the development not even giving a chance for anything to happen just in case someone decided that they want to keep it 
and prevent them from developing the land, which now is going to have uh, two towers from Renzo Piano or from Cisa Vieira. And that, that was a, that, that's a risk. And this owner that decided to, to make something out of the, the buildings could be because it needed some income to, to keep the, the land or could it be just because there was a good opportunity and they had a vocation to, to do it. Of course, even now, some part of Alex factory was already used and demolished to build new buildings. The, the core part is still there, but it might come the day where they need to, to just finish it off and just clean everything and end this experience. That might not become because it, the cultural part becomes so profitable and so important that they will not develop the land as previously intended, or they will need to end it and they will face, of course, some some contestation, some backlash. We won't know, but still, the we need to to keep in mind again that the learnings and the 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 way the the municipality, the people, the 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 investor actually all played together and let it flourish is very important and actually can be replicated in any building that has the safety conditions, has the 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 willing of the people to to go there and to work there. And every building could, could become something like Alex Factory. That's that's the important part of it. Thank you. I, I think both of these these responses illustrate also the comment that was made by Luisa Mainhout. Sorry if pronunciation if we're wrong but earlier about creative uh, sectors working together with retail and with tourism and the fact that this can be done in many different ways and you have many way uh, approaches possible and some of them can be very socially responsible and still very effective so i think this is one important lesson it's not the only way of doing it but at least it's a possibility and then there is no contradiction between these agenda necessarily so i think that's a, that's a nice lesson from this we already approaching what our scheduled end. I would just before we now start on the on the winding up, I would just remind you that you will there will be a survey popping up at the end when you disconnect from the meeting. So please take a minute to complete our survey. Just it's very useful for us to get a bit of feedback on 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 these on these webinars. Um, I would. Um, Maybe pass on. Well, first of all, thank our speakers very much for your presentation. It was very interesting to listen to you. I will mention that we have a policy brief that will be coming in the coming months, which will be partly working well using this output. So there will be a policy brief summarizing this and other material getting back to all the policy developments that Lars has now sketched or briefly described for us going a bit more in detail. Um, and so you will have a written document in the coming months on this basis. And I will pass the word on to Mart, who will just as a conclusion also say a few words about the other benefits that the policy learning platform and Interreg Europe could bring to, to you. Mart, please. Yeah, thank you. And also thank you from my side to our uh, speakers. Um, so I, I think you can see the screen, right? So, um, you know, as we are in a sort of a new phase of Interreg Europe, where we have new projects starting, new new uh, public authorities and regions have joined our network of Interreg Europe. Uh, we just wanted to sort of uh, go through a few, few few points that maybe you are not um, aware of. And the main thing is the policy learning platform. So uh, as any sort of interregional collaboration program, we have the projects, uh, like uh, Diego was uh, rep representing the Creja project from the previous programming period. But then we have the platform. And, and what the platform does really is like a second pillar of Interreg Europe that um, tries to take the knowledge that's generated within the projects and, and disseminate it with the whole community. So to, to avoid project silos, to avoid silos of policymaking learnings, and to try to sort of bring in and valorize the rich exchanges that's happening within projects. And the way we do this is um, through uh, by the community of people who are on our sort of web platform. So the project partners, the different uh, public authorities, the people attending today's session, um, the people you meet in different workshops and webinars. So uh, the workshops and webinars is one of our main avenue that we, with Eric and other colleagues, um, we organize and try to bring new value to the knowledge generated. Um, Eric also mentioned already written uh, documents like the policy briefs. These sort of condense developments on the EU policy level, but then bring in practicable examples uh, from around Europe. And then we have some tailored services that I will talk about uh, in, in a few slides. Uh, 
Um, so in general, I encourage you to visit um, the Interreg Europe uh, website and check the resources available. Um, there are multiple, well, thousands of good practices on various topics, but also related to uh, culture, creative industries, and, and social uh, inclusion and, and social enterprises uh, that you can find on the platform. I think we have by now around 3,000 different good practices around Europe on different topics. And then we have had, uh, of course, different webinars, just as today, they're available as recordings uh, to watch later. But here on the slide, you can see a few that um, have also tackled uh, topics on cultural and, and heritage. Um, but uh, what is interesting, perhaps, as well for our, our listeners, is that the Intergroup Policy Link platform offers uh, a free service uh, to public authorities across Europe. Well, two services, actually. One is a peer review, and another is a matchmaking. And these are tailored services so that when you approach us um, with the policy challenge or a policy question, uh, then we uh, try to find through our networks uh, experts to bring to your region and truly discuss uh, the, ch the challenge you have. So, for example, today in the chat, we saw a colleague was looking for inspiration about how uh, creative industries or enterprises and culture can be brought together in, in city centers. Um, that for us is all, all already like a policy challenge. And you could approach us uh, by requesting either the matchmaking or the peer review service, and um, we, we basically uh, come to your region. So the difference between these two services is that the matchmaking is an online session that we do for two hours. It's suitable for uh, maybe um, exploratory questions to see whether other people from Europe could, uh, could give you some good advice on this. The peer review is a two-day physical meeting um, where uh, we, we come to your region with four or five experts uh, to really give you in-depth policy advice. And, and I must emphasize once more, it's tailored. So it's all about the questions you put forward uh, uh, and, and, uh, and we then tailor the discussions around advice uh, to your challenges. Uh, so up to now, we've had 60 peer reviews uh, and it's an open call. So you can continuously apply uh, and uh, it's relatively low effort and it's a free service as already mentioned. So I encourage to, you to look into this. And uh, in general, uh, you're welcome to join our online community, our newsletter, and, and you know, just make use of the resources we have on our platform. Um, so from my side, thank you. And Eric, uh, back, back to you. Thank you very much, Mart. I hope this also gives you some ideas of how you could use the Intrig Europe platform. Um, I, well, thanks again for all the presentation for, I think, very interesting exchange entering this new exciting subject. This is a bit new all to Interreg Europe. So we're going into the social field, which I didn't say in the beginning now, but social is really new also to Interreg Europe. So we are trying to explore that and to bridge a bit between what has been done already in culture into now in the social field. So we're going to continue working on this topic in the coming weeks and months. And please don't have to hesitate to get in touch with you with your issues, with the questions you may have. And we can we have a wide range of services as Mart described. So we can we hope we can able to help you with your concrete issues. Thank you very much. And I hope we can keep in touch. Don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you. Bye bye.